Alright. Toxic Parents continued. Talking about Louise. Uh, small auburn haired woman in her mid 40s. When I first saw Louise, her extremely rigid posture and tight lipped expression said it all. She was a volcano of contained anger. I asked her about her divorce and she told me that the men in her life always left her. Her current husband was just the latest example. I'm one of those women who always picks Mr. Wrong. In the beginning of each relationship, it's terrific, but I know that it can never last. I listened intently as Louise expounded on the theme that all men are bastards. Then she began comparing the men in her life to her father. God, why can't I find somebody like my father? He looked like a movie star. Everybody just adored him. I mean, he had the charisma that just drew people to him. My mother was sick a lot, and my father would take me out. Just him and me. Those were the best times of my life. After my dad, they just broke the mold. I asked if, her if her father was still alive, and Louise became very tense, and she replied, I don't know. He just disappeared one day. I guess I was around 10. My mother was a real bitch to live with, and one day he just took off. No note, no phone call, no nothing. God, I missed him. For about a year after he left, I was so sure I could hear his car drive up every night. I can't really blame him for what he did. He was so full of life. Who'd want to be tied down to a sick wife and a kid? Louise was spending her life waiting for her idealized father to come back to her. Unable to face how callous and irresponsible he had been, Louise used extensive rationalization to keep him godlike in her eyes, despite the unspeakable pain his behavior had caused her. Her rationalization also enabled her to deny her rage at him for abandoning her. Unfortunately, that rage found an outlet in her relationships with other men. Every time she started seeing a man, things would go smoothly for a while as she got to know him. But as they grew closer, her fear of abandonment would get out of hand. The fear would invariably turn into hostility. She couldn't see a pattern in the fact that every man left her for the same reasons. The closer they got, the more hostile she became. Instead, she insisted her hostility was justified by the fact that they always left her. Anger where anger is due. When I was in graduate school, one of my psychology books contained a series of drawings that graphically illustrated how people displace feelings, particularly anger. The first frame showed a man being bowled out by his boss. Obviously, it wasn't safe for the man to yell back, so the second frame showed him displacing his anger by yelling at his wife when he got home. Then the third showed her yelling at the kids. The kids kicked the dog, and the dog bit the cat. What impressed me about this series of images was that despite its seeming simplicity, it was a surprisingly accurate portrayal of how we transfer strong feelings from the appropriate person to an easier target. Louise's opinion of men is a perfect example. They're all such wimpy bastards, all of them. You can't trust them. They always turn on you. I'm sick of being used by men. Louise's father had abandoned her. If she had acknowledged this fact, she would have renounced her cherished fan her cherished, she would have had to renounce her cherished fantasies and godlike image of him. She would have had to let him go. Instead, she displaced her anger and mistrust from her father to other men. Without being aware of it, Louise con consistently chose men who treated her in ways that both disappointed and enraged her. As long as she could release her anger at men in general, she didn't have to feel her anger at her father. Sandy whom we met earlier in the chapter, displaced onto her husband the anger and disappointment she felt toward her parents for the way they had treated her pregnancy and abortion. She couldn't allow herself to be angry at her parents. That would have been too threatening to her de deification, deification of her, of them. So I guess deification is like to make them godlike, de to deify. Yes. Death, uh, don't speak ill of the dead. Death does not end the deification of toxic parents. In fact, it may increase it. I guess deity, to make them into a deity, to, de, to deification. As hard as it is to acknowledge the harm done by a living parent, it is infinitely harder to accuse that parent once he or she is dead. There's a powerful taboo against criticizing the dead, as if we were kicking them while they're down. As a result, death imparts a sort of sainthood to even the worst abuser. The deification of dead parents is almost automatic. Unfortunately, while the toxic parent is protected by the sanctity of the grave, the survivors are stuck with the emotional remains. Don't speak ill of the dead may be a treasured platitude, but it often inhibits the realistic resolution of conflicts with dead parents. You'll always be my little failure. 
Valerie, a tall, delicate, featured musician in her late 30s, was referred to me by a mutual friend who was concerned that Valerie's lack of confidence <coughs> was preventing her from pursuing opportunities in her singing career. About 15 minutes into our first session, Valerie admitted that her career was going nowhere. I haven't had any kind of singing job, not even a piano bar, for over a year. I've been working temp in an office to pay my rent. I don't know, maybe it's an impossible dream. The other night I was having dinner with my folks, and we got into my problems, and my father said, Don't worry, you'll always be my little failure. I'm not, I'm sure he didn't realize how much it hurt, but those words really tore me apart. I told Valerie that anyone would feel hurt under the circumstances. Her father had been cruel and insulting. She replied, oh, I guess it's nothing new. That's the story of my life. I was the, the family garbage dump. I got blamed for everything. If he and my mom had problems, it was my fault. He was like a broken record. And yet, when I did anything to please him, he would beam with pride and brag about me to his cronies. God, it was wonderful to get his approval, but I felt like an emotional yo-yo sometimes. Valerie and I worked very closely together over the next several weeks. She was just beginning to contact the magnitude of her anger and sadness toward her father. Then he died of a stroke. It was an unexpected death, shocking, sudden, the kind for which no one is prepared. Valerie was overwhelmed by guilt for all the anger she had expressed towards him in therapy. I sat there in church while he was being eulogized, and I heard this outpouring of how wonderful he was all his life. I felt like I was being an asshole for trying to blame him for my own problems. I just wanted to atone for the pain I'd caused him. I kept thinking about how much I loved him and what a bitch I'd always been to him. I don't want to talk about the bad stuff anymore. None of this matters now. Valerie's grief got her off the track for a time, but eventually she came to see that her father's death could not change the reality of how he treated her during childhood and as an adult. Valerie has been in therapy for almost six months now. I've been happy to see her self-confidence improve steadily. She is still struggling to get her singing career off the ground, but it's no longer due to my lack of trying. Taking them down off their pedestals. Godlike parents make rules and judgments, and they make pain. When you deify... Your parents, living or dead, you're agreeing to live by their version of reality. You're accepting painful feelings as a part of your life, so perhaps even rationalizing them as being good for you. It's time to stop. When you bring your toxic parents down to earth, when you find the curse to look at them realistically, you can begin to equalize the power in your relationship with them. Chapter 2 Just because you didn't mean it doesn't mean it didn't hurt the inadequate parents. Children have basic inalienable, inalienable rights to be fed, to be clothed, sheltered, and protected. But along with these physical rights, they have the right to be nurtured emotionally, to have their feelings respected, and to be treated in ways that allow them to develop a sense of self-worth. Children also have the right to be guided by appropriate parental limits on their behavior, to make mistakes, and to be disciplined without being physically or emotionally abused. Finally, children have a right to be children. They have a right to spend their early years being playful, spontaneous, and irresponsible. Naturally, as children grow older, loving parents will nourish their maturity by giving them certain responsibilities and household duties, but never at the expense of the childhood. How we learn to be in the world. Children soak up both verbal and nonverbal messages like sponges indiscriminately. They listen to their parents, they watch their parents, and they imitate their parents' behavior. Because they have little frame of reference outside the family, the things that they learn at home about themselves and others become universal truths engraved deeply in their minds. Yeah, I remember uh, my old man actually would talk really bad about my mother's family. And so that's, that's how we all grew up. We all grew up thinking that my mother's family was um, not, not so great. And what's crazy is while he talked really bad about them, they all can't wait to, to go kiss his butt now. So it just it's it's fascinating how the the originator of that the hate and the source um it seems to be getting a a free pass almost and then people you know a lot of these kids are thinking of them like they're godlike that they cannot do any harm that every any of their bad things was justified so a lot of folks actually internalize a lot of the pain and abuse that they go through and they don't uh admit what it actually happened and therefore since they didn't admit to it they don't they don't go, um, they don't develop properly. They don't have a healthy uh, cog cognitive development. Uh, they'd have a typical, a normal childhood. So, 
Universal truths engraved deeply in their minds. Parental role, model, role models are central to a child's developing sense of identity, particularly as he or she develops gender identity. Despite dramatic changes in parental roles over the last 20 years, the same duties apply to parents today that apply to your parents. One, they must provide for their children's physical needs. Two, they must protect their children from physical harm. Three, they must provide for their children's needs for love, attention, and affection. They must protect, four, they must protect their children from emotional harm. Five, they must provide moral and ethical guidelines for their children. Clearly, the list could go on much longer, but these five responsibilities form the foundation of adequate parenting. So, since they form the foundation, I'm going to read them again, so they're that important. Number one. Parents must provide for their children's physical needs. Number two, parents must protect their children from physical harm. Number three, parents must provide for their children's needs for love, attention, and affection. Four, they must protect their children from emotional harm. Five, they must provide moral and ethical guidelines for their children. So, I got none of those. None of those I received in my childhood. It was all about do as I say and that's it. That's the only values that they had. That's the only principles or ethics that anybody could say of uh, just blind obedience. But they expected that of others and not uh, not themselves. So, because they're not obedient, right? They, uh, whatever. All right, so clearly the list could go on much longer. Uh, but these five responsibilities form the foundation of adequate parenting. The toxic parents will be discussing rarely get past the first item on the list. For the most part, they are or were significantly impaired in their own emotional stability or mental health. They are not only unavailable to meet their children's needs, but in many cases they expect and demand that their children take care of their parents' needs. When a parent forces parental responsibilities on a child, family roles become indistinct, distorted, or reversed. A child who is compelled to become his own parent or even become a parent to his own parent has no one to emulate, learn from, or look up to. Without a parental role model at this critical stage of emotional development, a child's personal identity is set adrift in a hostile seal of confusion. Less, age 34, the owner of a sporting goods store came to see me because he was a workaholic and it was making him miserable. My marriage went to hell because I never did anything but work. I was either gone or I was working at home. My wife got tired of living with a robot and then she left. Now it's happening again with the new lady in my life, and I hate it. I really do. I just don't know how to loosen up. Les told me he had trouble expressing emotion of any kind, particularly tender, loving feelings. The word fun, he told me, with considerable bit bitterness, wasn't in his vocabulary. I wish I knew how to make my girlfriend happy, but every time we start to talk, somehow I always steer the conversation back to work, and she gets upset. Maybe it's because work is the only thing I don't screw up. Les continued for the better part of a half an hour trying to convince me of how badly he messed up his relationships. The women I get involved with are always complaining that I don't give them enough time or affection, and it's true. I'm a lousy boyfriend and a really lousy husband. I stopped him and I said, and you've got a lousy self-image. It sounds as if the only time you feel okay is, it, is when you're working. How come? It's something I know how to do and I do it well. I work about 75 hours a week. But I've always worked my tail off, ever since I was a kid. See, I was the oldest of three boys. I guess my mom had some kind of breakdown when I was eight. Then from then on, our dark was, our house was always dark, with the shades drawn. My mother always seemed to be in her bathrobe, and she never talked much. My earliest memories of her were with a cup of coffee in one hand, a cigarette in the other, and glued to her goddamn soap operas. She never got up until long after we were off to school. So it was my job to feed my two younger brothers, pack their lunches, and get them to the school bus. When we got home, she'd be lying in front of the tube or taking one of her three-hour naps. Half the time while my buddies were out playing ball, I was stuck in the house cooking dinner or cleaning up. I hated it, but somebody had to do it. I asked Les where his father was in all this. Dad traveled a lot on business, and he basically just gave up on my mother. Most of the time, he slept in the guest room, and it was a pretty weird marriage. Uh, he sent her a couple to a couple of doctors, but they didn't help, so he just threw in the towel. I told Les that I ate for how lonely that little boy must have been. He dismissed my sympathy for the, with the reply. I had too much to do to feel sorry for myself. Robbers of childhood. So, as a child, Les was often weighed down with responsibilities that rightfully belonged to his parents. 
and more or less coming up.